uh, Molly McGrath was the sideline reporter. And once you realize that this is a big story, that's when her job really begins. Because now you're finding out, you know, is the potential number one pick in the draft going to play football again? And uh, I asked Fritzy, I said, would you reach out to ESPN, see if we could get Molly on, because I thought she did a great job. And uh, Molly joins us now. Molly, thanks for joining us. Where were you when Tua first went down with that injury? Thank you so much for having me on, Dan. Um, I was actually on Alabama's sideline when he went down with the injury. Uh, I was standing kind of next to Alabama's coaching box on the sideline, and I watched just the series of events unfold as I saw Mac Jones, the backup, warming up to go into the game. I saw the team huddle right in front of me with Tua in the middle and Mac Jones kind of on the periphery, and then Nick Saban comes in. Tua talks to Nick Saban, and I see Mac Jones go back onto the sideline and leave the huddle. So in that moment, hmm. I kind of I alerted my producer. I said, I don't think Mac Jones is going in. It looks like Tua is staying. Mac Jones is back on the sideline. And then, of course, we see Tua go out onto the field, and then that tragic ac accident, that, that freak injury happened. So I was on Alabama's sideline witnessing that. Tua went down closer to the Mississippi State sideline, so I crossed over to the other side of the field to just get a better vantage point to get closer, to try to hear what the trainers were saying to him, to look into Tua's eyes, see the pain that he was in, and just try to figure out what is the injury. The first thing and the only thing I knew at that moment was that he had no weight on that right leg, and of course he had just had surgery weeks ago on his right ankle, so that was of the biggest concern. What did you see and hear from Tua? Um, in, in that moment, um, I saw a ton of pain. He was, um, is he saying he anything? From, I, I couldn't hear what he was saying. Okay. They were talking really closely to him. I had to give enough space, right. To, to give a little, to give respect and to give enough space so that they can do their job. So I was on the sideline part. I wasn't on the field. Um, but I could hear them, you know, talking very closely to him. His face was bleeding. His nose was bleeding. And there was concern at first, like, what's going on with his face? Why is he bleeding from his face? And he had, um, you know, a towel covering his face and they kept that on his face longer than needed. And I could see it was because he was crying because he was kind of bawling in pain. So I knew that he was in serious pain and they lift him up. They put him on the cart and the cart just goes straight down the field. And I knew that it was crucial that I be there for when they take him off the cart because I needed to see how he got off the cart. If he was able to put weight on his right leg or the right side of his body, or if he had to be carried. So the cart goes down the field and I sprinted the length of the field from the 10 through the other end zone, <laughs> basically on the field past Joe Moorhead, who I heard say something like, whoa, <laughs> sorry, coach. As I run the length of the field, go into that, um, that tunnel that led to the x-ray room and that was the crucial moment that i witnessed where he couldn't get off of the cart on his own medical training staff had to pick him up and carry him almost like a child and when they picked him up that's when he was screaming in pain and then they brought him into the x-ray room and i got from a, a source close with the team that it was his hip not his ankle so it was Amazing to get all of that so quickly so that we went to break with the Tua injury. We were able to come back right away with the news that it was his hip, that he's in ex an extreme amount of pain, and that he's going for x-rays. Yeah, and you gotta you got to grab what you can grab, but you got to be fair to the situation. You can't speculate. Uh, you know, be, so be, when, they, when they're going to throw it down to you, you go, I, I think he may have. It's got to be, I'm being told. And, you know, you got like three or four minutes to kind of cobble all this together and then go on live TV with an injury that, you know, could affect uh, Alabama's entire season. So that's why I, I marvel at that, because you're trying to find this out in real time and, you know, just trying to figure out because there's chaos there. And then even the Alabama yeah. people don't know exactly. They took him to Mississippi State's end of the the, the stadium that's when I knew they probably have, you know, their better medical facilities down there or more medical facilities. That's the one thing I thought in the moment. It's really, really serious if they were headed there. Maybe that didn't factor in, Molly, but I did think that when I saw that they were taking him in that direction. Yeah, well, I knew that there was an x-ray room through that tunnel. Um, and I knew that they were going on the other side of the tunnel is an ambulance. 
So that was the first thing. Okay, they're taking him to an x-ray room. They're probably going to take him to an ambulance this time around. And I covered to his first injury this season, his right ankle injury against Tennessee. And, um, you know, I had heard rumblings that he was leaving in an ambulance during that game. And I ran outside of the stadium and did circles on the periphery of the stadium looking for his ambulance. So I wasn't going to let that happen again. Um, so we had eyes on the ambulance. We had eyes on the x-ray room obviously um, wanting to be respectful and give space to the athlete, but also wanting to answer questions that people have about one of the most important players in college football. You know, time is of the essence in these things, and people at home are wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was crucial that I be there in that tunnel, that I see what I saw when they had to lift him up off of the cart, and that I got the information that it was his hip, not his ankle. I think that was the most important news of the day. And Nick Saban confirmed it right after in my interview with him um, that it was a hip injury. I think that took everyone by surprise. And, you know, all this is happening. I'm, like, trying to calm myself down as I get all of this information, trying to put it together in my head, telling my producer, you can come back to me out of break. I have, I have information I can give. And then trying to calm myself down so I can interview one of the greatest coaches um, of my time, you know, to interview Nick Saban and ask him some really tough questions. And you could just see the, the despair on his face when I was talking to him. That was a really, a really tough interview, but I think Nick, Nick handled it really well. We're talking to Molly McGrath, ESPN college football, college basketball sideline reporter. Uh, when did you decide what were you were going to ask Saban in those always difficult, you know, ending the half, uh, you know, coming off the field? Yeah, so before Tua's injury, the question in my mind was, when are you going to take Tua out? Like, are we going to see him at all in the second half? Mm. After the injury, of course, everything changed. And um, I've, I've worked with Nick Saban before. I believe I have a good rapport with him. And he is very respectful when you ask the right questions. And I've had great interactions with him. So I knew that I needed – It's. it's I, I said this – to um, John Walters with The Athletic, it's the same thing that coaches say. You need to know your personnel. I'm going to ask questions differently to Nick Saban than I would to Mike Leach and then I would to Tom Izzo. So I knew for Nick Saban my first question had to be something broad where I could let him give me what he had. So it was something to the effect of what can you tell us about Tua? Because in the past, with his right ankle injury, when I asked a question like that, he gave me a good amount of information. When you give him the floor, he'll be honest. So he gave information that it was the right hip. They don't know how serious it is, but it could be serious. And then the follow-up was the tricky part. Um, and I talked to my producer, you know, beforehand, and he said, are you going to ask him why he left Tua in? Mm. And I said, yes, but I'm going to frame it differently because you don't want to put a coach on the defensive at halftime, especially after such an emotional moment. And you could see kind of the shock on Nick's face and watching it back you know, you could see how upset he was. So I'm glad I didn't ask him a question that would make him feel defensive. Instead, I used what I saw on the field and what we put in our broadcast to support my question. I said, you know, we saw Mac Jones warming up. Did Tua lobby to stay in? And that was my way of asking whose decision was it to keep Tua in the game? Mm. Yeah. And I applaud you for that because that was that was the tough – that's the money question right there. That's as tough as it gets in our business where he's just lost a transcendent player and has no idea the severity, and he wants to go in and regroup and check on Tua, and your job is to stare it down and ask two questions and let him go. So I applaud you on that, Mal. That was great stuff and uh, continued success, and we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And hi to the Danettes. All right, Molly McGrath. And how about that? A shout out to the Danettes. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune in to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV. Stream for free on BR Live or download the Dan Patrick Show app.